Welcome to Alarm Will, our series where we get to know a composer on our terms. We're here today for an episode we're calling Alarm Will Vinyl. I'm here with composer Taishan Sori and composer and pianist John Arf, and we're going to go shop for some music. Let's do it. I gotta say, this record right here, uh -huh. um, it takes me back. You know, I have two copies of this actually. It's, just, it's uh, takes you back how? It, like this takes me back to my college days. Like I remember at William Patterson um, happening upon this record, um, and I don't know what got me into it. Well, a teacher, um, a, like somebody who I've kind of studied composition with informally, named Anton Vischio, um, who's still remains a um, huge influence for me, um, got me into Cage and people like that and all the people in the New York school and everything, the work of Wolf, Feldman, Brown and, and Cage. And um, I remember him telling me about Fontanamix and everything, which is, you know, and, and this is just, I think this is just the tape part, actually. Right. Um, but I remember hearing that recording and being so into it. That you got two copies of this. And I got two copies of it. <laughs> and uh, the burial on here, the visage piece, that's somewhat overlooked. Like, I don't hear much people talking about that. Oh, they, they should. And what he did, what, what Kathy Barbarian did. Uh, right. Because it's her, yes. her voice and, and so much of what he, of his innovations were a result of his collaboration with, with her. With her, right. And, exactly. Yeah. I mean, but what's, what was so unbelievable about this record, you know, even at that time when I was listening to Visage, was just the amount of stuff he was able to do with the voice, you know, on here. At that time, I wasn't at all really that hip to, you know, I mean, of course, I understood what was happening in contemporary music and stuff like that, but I'd never heard any, any music that sounded like that. But also it gets into experimentalism, and do you consider yourself an experimentalist? I don't know. I don't like to say that what I do is experimental because then it makes it sound like I don't really know what I'm doing or it makes it sound like you know, there's no rigor and no thought into what I'm putting in. To Varez had the same problem with the term experimentalist. Right. Yeah. To me, I consider myself a person who tries to organize this stuff in the most coherent and most lucid way that I can hear it and everything. I mean, I just write the music I most like to hear. And if it happens through experimentation, then that's one thing. But also organization is also a key part of it. And rigor. And rigor, right. Because I've heard in, in, in other interviews you've done and things you've talked about the, that um, the term improvisation is, right. doesn't do justice to what um, that tradition is that right. because people feel like it doesn't, it, you have this implication that it's not rigorous. So yeah, you want yeah, to talk yeah. a little bit exactly. about that? Exactly, yeah. I mean, and that's, that's something that I tend to shudder at even in my own music. You know, I often prefer the term spontaneous composition, which is what I like to say what it is. You know, um, there's a Lucas Foss article, Improvisation versus uh, Composition, I think. It's an incredible essay, but I don't agree with it. Um, and um, for me, it's like, you know, because, you know, he's essentially saying that composition is not improvisation and vice versa, which, I mean, I don't know. It's problematic. Yeah. In a certain way, it kind of situates so called jazz and improvisation as kind of a form of music that is not necessarily under the canon of serious music, which I don't necessarily Deeply problematic at all. Yeah. I mean, I consider, you know, this kind of stuff very much in the canon of serious music. Uh, where it becomes a problem for me is when, um, you know, people look at so-called jazz and stuff like that or whatever as though, as though it were like this other music that like doesn't belong, you know, there's, there's no seriousness in what those people are doing. Everything they're doing is you know, intuitive and from the heart and from this and that. We're, like, there's no, it's ridiculous. I mean, there's nobody out here going around not thinking while they're playing music, right? I mean, at least, at least that's what I like to think. You know what I mean? I don't, you know, I don't go on. I don't, I don't do this music. I don't, I don't even experiment with music without thinking. Like, there's always something that's, you know, that's. Uh, that holds it together. The only way not to experiment is to write according to formula, and no serious artist does that. They're always innovating. They're always pursuing or yeah. building upon. Yeah. I mean, that creative I mean, spark like, like, is like, both head and heart. Right, right. I mean, John Cage is not formula, you know, for instance. Right. Feldman is not formula. Within four seconds of a CD just coming to life in my car, you recognize the the very track which, which was happening, and the, the box wasn't in, in view. So so this this was like instant mega 
uh, 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 cred. I'm like, holy cow, this guy just, you know, so he must listen to everything. <laughs> yeah, I just remembered, I mean, that Ollie Wilson, and we'll get to this one in a yeah. minute, but, uh, but the Ollie Wilson uh, piece um, just, I mean, it floored me when I first heard it. Right. I mean, it was just incredible, like the, you know, it's just the degree of orchestration, you know, that that he just, it's just, his orchestration is just absolutely impeccable yes. and everything. And so just like, just in listening and, and also rhythmically too, how dense everything can get and everything. Yeah. And those layers are, are clear you know, with repeated listening. You can you can keep up with a, a pretty sophisticated polyphony. Yeah, yeah, yeah very much. A lot, a lot of polyphony there, you know, in, in his work. And so you you have the whole. This is so part I, of the series. This, yeah, this, this is this this record is part of the series. And and George Walker, of of course, also takes me back. You know, for a very long time during my undergraduate days at William Patterson, George Walker's um, sense of harmony is um, is really something that strikes me. You know, every time I listen to his music. You know, and 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 he's another one of those people who you can't really put in a box. You know, another one of those composers. Him and Ali both. I mean, like these are composers who you can't, and, and Ulysses K, for that matter, you can't really put these people into a box at all. One of the things that that I think about a lot is uh, there are these uh, great composers, yeah. and in recent years or decades they've passed on, but they've left the body of really wonderful work. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel comfortable just relegating them to the uh, new music category because they wrote great music that that is reflective of its time, but it still says a lot, and it exactly. should it deserves wider wider uh, uh, exposure and uh, you know it, it, it shouldn't be marginalized with the, the, the new music subset. Uh, and that's the exact same attitude that I have about my own work you know also like I'm not you know it's like I'm not about trying to be some kind of avant-garde right. you know composer like I don't care about that you know I, I'm just doing my thing you know I'm just you know I'm just writing what I like to hear and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know and uh, whatever box you want to put it under that's up to you but I don't see those boxes and they don't exist for me. Right. And and I think for these composers it was kind of the same thing like where George Walker, Ulysses K, Ali Wilson, Talib Rasul Hakim, all of these really great black composers or whatever as part of that series. I mean every piece they wrote had like kind of a different language to it. There was always something different about what they came up, you know, composition. What they came up with compositionally, um, it's just, it's it's fascinating to watch. And and I agree with you when you say that, you know, well they're not they're not trying, you know, I, I would feel when well, you said you would feel uncomfortable putting them into the category of new music or or avant garde music or something. It's like yeah, I, that's how I feel about myself too. Like yeah. in terms of not necessarily relating to this ideal of being the next avant-garde black composer like that's that's not you know i'm just doing what i want to do you know and um and whatever language it's you whatever language i'm expressing it in it's you know it's up you know that's you know as long as it's coming from a place of honesty in a place of sincerity which it always does i mean speaking for myself then yeah i mean it's it, it's it's perfect you know if it's good in this area, it's good in this area, and if it's, you know, that's yeah, kind of the, the label helps a little bit, but it can harm more than whether. Well, it can restrict. Yeah. When, when the label becomes restrictive, then then people, <coughs> large groups of people who should be exposed to this music, don't have that opportunity. Right. And yeah. Yeah. it can be a welcome mat, but it can also be a closed door mm -hmm. a label. Yeah. So it's actually huh? so it's actually composers like George and you know all of these other, all of these other composers or whatever who. Who we're dealing with. I mean, Adolphus Hillstork is another one. Um, incredible. Hale Smith is another one. Um, all of these incredible black composers, you know, along with the work of the AACM that I've heard and everything. I mean, these are the people who told me, you know, through their music that it's okay to want to pursue this and do whatever you want to do and write the music that you'd like to hear, no matter how avant garde or how how whatever you know the term is. So I, I have a question and it, it intersects with what we're talking about low labels and, and avant-garde and everything else. Um, sometimes jazz is described as quote-unquote America's, America's classical music but the more I thought about that the more I personally had problems with that because there is such a thing as um, jazz obviously but then there's also American classical music just written by increasing numbers of composers with diverse backgrounds, and I wanted. It, this seems as good a time as any to, to ask. You know, how how should those how should we evolve these labels? Uh, well, I don't I don't think about jazz. I don't think about jazz. First of all, that yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah. So that's the first thing. And secondly, 
Um, it's funny how people say that it's America's classical music, and yet it's very undervalued and underappreciated and disrespected and misdocumented on every level. I mean, it's, it's really interesting to see that, you know, people try to claim that and then, but if you look at how they treat the people who make the music and the creators of the music and the musicians who do it and the composers who have done it for, you know, over the last hundred years, I mean, when you look at how that's been going, I mean, why would they try to claim something that they have a lack of appreciation for? It just makes no sense to me. I mean, the music I create is from a black aesthetic, and the black aesthetic has always been one that is about inclusion and one that is about, you know, um, dealing with any possible kind of music or any possible kind of art that you can to make to make in your own personal, you know, take on it or whatever. And so my music is in dialogue not only with, you know black American music, but also music of Africa, music of the Pacific, music of Asia, music of Europe, I mean, just, you know, music of India, I mean, pretty much anywhere. Like, all of these musics, you know, inform me in some way or another. And, um, you know, I mean, my, my work doesn't have to privilege notation. It doesn't have to privilege in improvisation either, you know. So it, it can go, like I was saying before, it can go in any direction you want it to as long as it comes from that place of honesty. Right. Oh, Lerdo. <laughs> Great. You know, I have the piece Wake that he did um, on, on LP as well, um, which I think is a great work. But Lerdo is one of my biggest heroes, too, um, in composition. And um, what, what did he do for you as, as a... Well, he was a principal teacher. And, uh, and so, you know, both, I mean, if it weren't for George and Fred, I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing today. And, um, and honestly, and I say that in all honesty, because uh, both of them, you know, in working with uh, both George and Fred, it's funny that we have, you have book here and then we have uh, Lerdahl's recording. Um, they instilled a belief you know, they like sort of, they basically told me to stop bullshitting. <laughs> you know, stop trying to be something that, stop trying to be the composer who I'm not, who I'm not, you know, and what they meant by that is they, they, they saw the potential in me to be able to create something that's unique and that's personal and everything. But also I was trying too hard to kind of fit into what, you know, everybody else was doing and that kind of thing. So they basically just, you know, and Lerdahl, I mean, in the nicest, gentlest way he, he could, you know, we know, I mean, well, Lerdahl, he's a very direct, you know, he's, he's a very direct kind of person, but, you know, he was, he was very, very sweet about it, and he basically told me, you know, you need to embrace where you come from, and you need to embrace who you are and where you're going, you know, and stop trying to, you know, trying to be like everybody else or be something you're not and everything you know make your compositions as coherent as what you already do when you improvise and that kind of thing okay. not necessarily do something that mirrors you know what I do when I improvise but at least do something with the same amount of coherency and the same level of um, craft you know that I put into my improvisation into the composition and um, that was a very profound thing, and I, I remember crying in his office, you know, after him telling me that, because it was like, man, like, he is so right. Like, just, like, why am I sitting here trying to do what everybody, what all of my colleagues are doing? Like, you know, every, all of my colleagues are making different music, and I love their music and everything, but it's not me. You know, it's not really what I'm trying to do, personally. <laughs> you could do it well in each case, but he <laughs> yeah. really needed to tap into that. Yeah, and, and I just... needed to get more into myself and yeah. to be more honest with myself in everything. And, um, you know, both George and Fred were very much, you know, on me about that, you know, and they instilled a belief in me that I didn't think I'd ever be able to instill in myself, you know, and like, I, like, like they believed in me more than I believed in myself which was a problem because it's like I need to get to a place where I can really define my own terms and get to a place where I can you know write what it is I want to hear without compromise and without feeling like oh well what's my colleagues gonna think or 
or even now, what are my teachers going to think? You know, it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's about being honest with yourself. In art making, there are fears about the self and fears about others. And yeah. it's good to recognize which ones we're vulnerable to. Right. And the advice they gave you is golden advice for any young artist. Yeah. Find your voice, be yourself. Right. Um, pursue what is unique to you. Mm -hmm. um, and it works yeah. when that can hit you in a right. way that you're like, that, I understand what they mean now. Yeah. And it sounds like you had that moment in the office with Fred Lerdahl oh, that yeah. day. The biggest problem was me feeling like I had to prove something, you know, through my <laughs> composition, you know. And that, you know, and when, when a person can hear that, like that, that's, that's telling, you know, it's really telling. And so I decided to, get to a place where, you know, I want to write something that I really want to hear and something that I really want to do. Well, that was a really fun shop and a visit. I knew you guys would have a lot to talk about. I didn't know it was going to be so much of a trip down memory lane for you, but it was really yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. yeah, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And uh, talk about music with this guy, I mean, we can go. We, we can keep going. I know, we call him the He-Man Jukebox. <laughs> great. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, thank, you. Thanks. thank you. Thanks. Yep. Thank you.